Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tech Down Over. We are Hi. just about getting started. We've got with us Hugh Brownstone today. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a return guest. Though. We love having him on. He's, he's good. Um, and by the way, Hugh, we do love your podcast. You do a great job on them. Um, mm -hmm. um, and Thanks, I got to tell you something. This is sort of interesting. Um, I was in a meeting the other day, and this is for a financial uh, project that we're doing on collections and other things. And, and the lady goes, well, this software is kind of like the elephant and the blind men. And I looked at her and I went, <laughs> I'm on the phone. And I said, Stella, back it up a second. Did you just say blind men and the elephant? She goes, he started giggling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know the parable. She goes, oh, yes, it's such a good parable. She was from Africa somewhere, I think. And she goes, that's such a good parable. I go, that's funny. It's, it's a great one. I thought of you immediately. I go, hey, yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's funny how we equate the sayings with the people who say them and yes. um, and that is a great old parable and it and it fit because what she was saying in this case is that depending on how you touch this software it's like a part of an elephant it's totally different you don't know which part you're touching until you see the whole thing and for her to use that in a business meeting i was floored i went that's beautiful i love that it's, it doesn't happen very often beautiful so anyway all right so here we go we are going to start the show recording in three Two and one. Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Down Over. I'm Rick Zanotti and we are joined today by Hugh Brownstone and to the far, well, what is it? To the far <laughs> left of him. <laughs> <The other> side. <laughs> I was trying to figure out what side am I on here? It's inverted. Uh, we've got our co-host Jeff Blanchard coming in from Australia and Hugh's coming in. Are you in Pennsylvania today? I am in Pennsylvania yeah. today. And I'm on the Pacific side near Los Angeles. So. Here we are, and um, well, we might as well play an intro while we're at it. Here we go. And we are back. And uh, you know, pre-show, he was telling us a little bit about you're doing a documentary right now, your GH5 experiences. Um, You've been busy. You've been busy reviewing cameras and all sorts of good stuff. How's the uh, the GH5 treating you right now? The, the GH5 was absolutely the correct purchase for what I'm doing now. It's the next step in my evolution as a filmmaker, and that is documentary work. Uh, so... <laughs> I needed to get past the 30 minute limit and I needed to not worry about overheating and I didn't really care about autofocus um, and I didn't care about uh, high ISO performance either because when I'm doing interviews or conversations I'm lighting so I'm using the GH5 at ISO 200 or 400 I'm using a couple of primes that are just beautiful they're small they're Pack sharp, mm -hmm. contrasty, tasty <laughs> is the word that I use. Um, the uh, the Sigma thirty millimeter one point four. Fantastic. Oh yeah, that's a nice one. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the Leica fifteen millimeter one point seven. So I, I I'm able to travel very lightly, and I'm actually using the preamps in the camera. So all of a sudden, I don't have to take the Tascam DR seventy D. Uh, I am using either the Sony uh, UWP wireless mm -hmm. or the Rode Maker, uh, the Rode Filmmaker uh, wireless as well. But it is a great, great kit. Now, I also uh, love that the batteries are bigger. And mm -hmm. you asked me before we started the show, Rick, if I'm using the battery grip, and, and I am, and I'm using it because uh, it allows me to hot swap. It runs down the battery grip first. Mm -hmm. And as other uh, people have said, it has to exhaust before you pull it out. But then mm -hmm. you put in another one, it's going over to the internal battery for a few seconds and you're great. However, the one thing that annoys the crap out of me, what do you notice? The tripod mount. What about it, Jeff? in the wrong position, that it's blocking something? Mm -hmm. Not that it's blocking something, but it is off axis from the it's lens. Just, it, and it's, yes, it is. that's right. And, and they so, deliberately didn't fix that. I don't know why. So that's, that's actually pretty amazing. It blows my mind, because what that means is, if this is sitting on a rail system... <laughs> You're off. <laughs> 
you can't use a uh, un unless you you know unless you've got some additional uh, latitude in a sideways uh, 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 movement. You can't line it up with uh, a mat box or you know filter holders. So right. That's right. that's surprising. And, and you know it's so sort of funny I, they they knew that was a problem with the GH4. People complained about it. And they actually ignored it for some of the. I saw one of the podcasts was one one of their I guess evangelists, and he went, mm, "It's still the same." And people kind of went, "Why? What does it cost to just machine it over a little bit? It's a brand new grip anyway. Uh, the old grip doesn't fit, even though it's very similar in size. It's just a little bit bigger." And they didn't machine it over for no real reason because nothing's in the way of any doors or anything at that point. Mm. So well, I was one, I was wondering why that is, and yeah, even the battery doesn't get in the way. I mean, no, not anymore. I mean, nothing gets in the way. Uh, so it was just a little oddity. Yep. Yep. So, but but that notwithstanding, uh, it is exactly what I expected it to be. It's great for this purpose. Uh, the remote application is also great uh, because I can manually focus. I can punch autofocus if I mm -hmm. want that once and then lock it down. So it's, it's really terrific. The, uh, the touch implementation is the best that I've seen uh, on this size and form factor camera. Yep. So <clears throat> that's, that's something else. I really like the way it feels in hand, although, again, for the most part, I'm using it on a tripod right. i did uh take it no so so jeff you're in australia and rick you're in california mm -hmm. and these are just very hip places i'm in suburban mm -hmm. philadelphia which is a very <laughs> unhip place but with that being said if you take the time to see wherever you happen to be you inevitably find amazing things so mm -hmm. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I found this place in, in Lancaster, Dutch Amish country, roadside America. I tested the GH5. That was cool, by the way. That, that looked like a fun place. It, it was, and I ran the ISO up to 12,800. And I'm not saying you couldn't see the difference. Of course you could. Yeah. But the point that, that I made in, in that podcast is, look, if you're not like us, if you're not a filmmaker, if you're just a, a viewer, if you're a, an audience mm. member, you're not going to see this stuff. And oh, by no. the way, if you're one of those few people who would, well, neat noise reduction or whatever noise reduction tool you use works pretty darn well. It does. And also, I, you know, it's funny. I, I'm not a fan of non-noise. Every so often, some of that texture doesn't look badly. Um, oh, yeah. And, and what you did in Roadside America was, I think I've been close to that place because we had an account years ago in Mount Hope, Ohio, which is not far from Pennsylvania. And... It was, it's very much Amish country out there. And I was going, that's such a cool place where, where you were and the shots you took and everything. And frankly, those, those night shots, or you should, let's just say low light shots, they weren't that bad. You know, I didn't even think of the noise. I just thought it looked good. Yeah, it's just, it was cool. It looked good. And yeah, I guess if you, you really zoom in, you'll go, oh, it's a little noisy, but it didn't seem to affect the shot at all. And, um, I thought it was neat, and it's a camera that you can use for that. Now, it's funny. If I bought my little prop with me today, too. Now, so here's my, and I was kidding with Jeff earlier before we got you on. This is my GH5. Now, I've got this decked out in DSLR mode, if you will. I've got the Metal Bones adapter, the .64 or 7 or whatever it's called. Here, I've got the Sigma 50 here, and the F1.4 Sigma 50. And then the G with the battery grip and stuff, I go, I'm holding a 5D Mark IV. My, it's not much different in weight and everything. Um, I, have a, I have a 5DSR Canon, and, you know, it's, a, it's about a half pound heavier. But that's not that big a difference from what this is, just holding it. And yet, when I, like you do, when I go with the light lenses, the, the Leica lenses, and, man, they are just amazing. They're sharp. I don't have the... 30 millimeter one. I've got the um, I've got the Noctocron, the 42.5, and I've got the uh, the 15 millimeter Leica or Leica. Uh, I love that one. The 15 is it's not it's not a stabilized lens, but on the GH5 it works a whole lot better than it did on the GH4, and it's a beautiful little lens for it was like a $400 lens, and I go this thing is great. Uh, the Noctocron's expensive. It's like uh, I think I paid 13, 1400 for it. 
I, is it worth it? Yeah, I think, sort of. It's a lot of money for one lens. Uh, but it does look beautiful, especially if you're in a slightly lower light situation. I don't shoot in darkness, but in a slightly lower light, the thing's amazing. It just eats light for breakfast. And it's sharp. It is a sharp oh. lens. It's a little bit heavier. It's about twice as heavy as a normal lens. Oh, but Hugh, you know how you're having problems with your Apple? I yeah. made a mistake the other day. I grabbed my other G. We bought two of them. I grabbed <laughs> my other one, put it in my low, <laughs> low pro tactical backpack. And I had just finished showing one of the girls here how it had a side pocket and you could just pull it right out. And no. she went, oh, that's really cool. She's a photographer and she thought that was really neat. Um, and then I went back an hour later to put the camera away and I go, oh, I closed the top. So I opened the top, put it back in, lifted it, no problem. Took it to my office, no problem. And then when it was time to go home, I'm talking to, to my wife and uh, my son-in-law who happened to be here at the time. <laughs> and I lifted the thing over my back and I watched this little black thing fly out of it full speed. <laughs> oh, went, oh, no. Oh, no. I, we couldn't, none of us could react in time because it just flung out fast. Bounced three times and the lens, which is the 60 millimeter uh, f2.8 to 4, the nice one, grand for that damn lens, sheared right off. Yeah, sheared off the mount. The mount, it got the mount for the lens stayed on the camera. Camera, nothing. Uh, there was one thing wrong. It, I can't put the metal bones on it. It doesn't seem to recognize it exists. <laughs> it, so there's something wrong with the mount. But other than that, runs perfectly. Didn't have any dent, no mark, nothing. But the lens sheared off. And I'll tell you, when you see that lens open, it is held by fish wire and three little hooks to the. <laughs> aluminum mount it was so cheaply I, for, for a grand i couldn't believe that's how they hooked it together mind you i shouldn't have dropped it but seeing the result of the drop i went oh man that's it no wonder it sheared off um, see, just, but to, to be fair rick yeah. years and years ago i had a uh, an eos 3 mm -hmm. a Canon eos 3 which was the most advanced 35 millimeter SLR they had. I, I think even though it was one rung down from the EOS one, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was more advanced. It had the eye autofocus, and I had the predecessor to the 24 to 70, which was the 28 to 70 2.8 L. Mm -hmm. uh, I dropped it, and that lens sheared off as well. Oh, and it's it's built like a tank, so I had to send yeah. it back. And they, and they got it repaired. Uh, but the thing that's interesting about micro four thirds lenses is they are expensive. I mean, yeah. I, Noctocron has the image stabilization. As you may recall, mm -hmm. it was the one lens that met all of my criteria before I bought the right. GH5. But it is an 85 2.4. That's what it is. That's and, true. And Sony has an 85 1.8 for, what is it, 600 bucks? Literally half the price, which from uh, what I've seen in, in DxO Mark is every bit as sharp, if not sharper. And the one thing about the Noctocron, and, and you have it, so you would know better well, than Well, the Noctocron's an F1.2. It's, it's, it's actually 1.2. Did you find there was any uh, CA? Um, not really. At least I didn't notice it on, on the stuff I've been shooting. Not too much. But frankly, none that I really noticed. That I went, hmm, that looks a little off. No, I'd say it okay. looked pretty clean. On the shots I've taken, and most of it's been more daylight. No, I haven't seen any, any chromatic aberration at all. Well, cool. May have been just the example. Now, what else, what other lenses are you using? Have you been using the 18 to 35 or the 50 to 100 with that 0.64 metabones? Mm, yes, I've got, now it works with the Sigma. So I've been using the 50, the 18 to 35. Uh, I have a Sigma, uh, what is it? 24 to 105, I think. I can't remember what it was. Maybe, it, how, I think it's 24 to 104 or one, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 20 to 124, I can't remember. Uh, that's one of the, the, the big zooms. And I've also used the Canon 35 millimeter, which runs pretty nicely on it. The, the higher end one, it was like, it's like the $500 one. It's, it ran nicely. Um, and I've also been using the um, Tamron 85 millimeter, runs beautifully on it. In fact, the Tamron runs really quite nice on the, on the GH5, as does the Tamron 70 to 200. I think it runs 
probably nicer than the, I think, 40 to 150 Olympus, which I have also. The, the Tamron's nice. I, I can't complain about that one. 7200's a clean, nice lens, very stable. Uh, I can shoot without, without a tripod on it at a distance, and there's no movement, which, which actually shocks me. It's pretty good. Well, that's the other thing, of course. The uh, the in body image stabilization on the GH five is fantastic. It, it is. And yeah. uh, I was last weekend. Claudia and I went out to something, a place called Radnor Hunt, uh, for the eighty seventh running of the Radnor Hunt races for open spaces. So this is a uh, this is horse country, uh, suburban yeah. Philadelphia. And uh, Panasonic was kind enough to lend me their one hundred to four hundred. Mm. Uh, 4.5 to 6.3, is yeah. it? Yeah. 4.0 uh, to 6.3. And I was I was very interested to see how it works because this is image stabilized. And uh, I also had, for comparison purposes, and I want to hear about uh, how you're doing with the X-T2, but I had this, which is uh, the X-T20 mm -hmm. with the 100-400 uh, Fujinon. And what I found is that the limit or the gating factor, this should be no surprise to either of you, was me, not, not the gear. Uh, with that being said, even though people say that there's less rolling shutter on micro four thirds cameras, and I say I never do whip pans. Right, right. But when you're uh, on the rail and you're watching the horses come across the finish line, it's the perfect opportunity to see that rolling shutter is alive and well on <laughs> all of them. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Actually, Jeff, you've you've done uh, some shooting of horses in stables, in equestrian parks, and other things, and you've got Panasonic Micro Four Thirds cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, have you noticed a lot of rolling shutter on your stuff? Well, I haven't on mine, but then again, I'm pretty much like you. You're very well aware of that, so you make sure you don't move terribly quickly. You let the, the things come past you rather than you move the camera. So not as much as uh, the earlier days, but uh, it, you know, I tend not to uh, get into that situation. But I, too, I'm still in the market, Hugh, for the GH5. I'm, I'm still waiting for... All you guys to do all your testing, but I was quite thrilled to see your one with the the model railway because I just saw all the focusing things you were doing, the pulling focus, and just the way it did track very well for for the normal people. Like they say, may not suit everybody, but for what it does, it did a damn good job. And I was glad to hear that you're saying you're doing. Uh, starting some documentaries because at the end of that you sort of had a little interlude to that I thought oh you should start doing some documentaries because he did a you did a little three or four minute interview with the, the person at, at the the rail park so that was interesting and that was handheld oh that was yeah. handheld <laughs> that's good yeah. yeah well you know a and lot of people are saying that the gh5 in essence is almost like having a, a gimbal it's not far from it I, I have an osmo i've had a gimbal before and as i'm panning across with the gh5 i'm i'm remarking as when i look at the film later i go darn that's pretty darn mm -hmm. good for handheld i mean it's amazing as long as you, you're fairly stable yourself it's pretty amazing the results you get from them it's it's clean I would say it, it's more akin to a tripod where you're doing mm. a pan or mm -hmm. a tilt and a gimbal. Yep. Uh, because my experience is like you, Rick. I can go like this, yeah. and a casual uh, observer may not even recognize that I'm using uh, just my <laughs> hands. Yeah, I didn't realize you were handheld with that interview. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I never would have guessed it. It's, it was really steady. Yeah, so, so that, that was fantastic. And by the way, that was with uh, a non-image stabilized lens. Once again, it was the 30mm uh, 1.4 Sigma. Now, there was something else that I noticed. I need to double check this. Maybe you guys have heard of this, but, and, and again, I, I'm really not sure that I actually saw this, but it felt like I did. Uh, when I tested the uh, transition focus for the first time, I was using a Leica Lumix 25mm, what is it, 1.8, 1.4. Mm -hmm. 
And there are different speeds that you can do these uh, transition focuses, these focuses. When I was at Roadside America using the Sigma, it seemed to me that no matter what speed I used, it was the same speed. Now, hmm. maybe that was just wrong. Maybe it was a perception thing as a result of the distances that I was using. I'm not sure. But have you heard anything about that? The, uh, the notion that maybe if it's not a Panasonic branded lens, the speed adjustments won't work? It's all one speed? I've heard it from people who have Metabones, for example. We're using Metabones on the Sigma. Interesting. But th I've only heard that because the Metabones may introduce a slight slow down on focus i have noticed it a little bit if i'm focused if i'm panning a little quickly and i don't pan that fast but if i go just a little fast on let's say the sigma 50 it does catch up a little bit meaning as i'm going through something pretty the same distance it's pretty good then when i get slightly out of distance it's like a shimmer and you have to kind of pay attention if you blink you'll miss it but yeah, I've noticed that there is a little bit of a focus delay on panning. Not so much if it's coming at me. That seems to work pretty well. But if I'm actually, if I'm stationary and I'm just swinging my body gently, like to the side, a little bit of a shimmer sometimes, but it's, I can't even say it's all the time. It just seems like sometimes. Other times it seems like it's a lot. Other times, nothing. So maybe there's a slight inconsistency in the way it looks at, at, the external lenses with with the metabones uh, I have not noticed it at all on the on the Panasonic Leica lenses at all they've all been great right well I'll be putting out the uh, results of the real-world GH5 uh, test at the uh, horse races next week hmm. But well, Jeff, what you'll notice, and, and of course Rick, you will too, because you're both highly educated visual guys, you will notice that uh, this was a steeplechase, and as the horses came over, uh, I found that the GH5 really couldn't uh, maintain lock, and so the next time around, I kind of gave up on that. Uh, there was another time that I tried where it seemed to work, but as soon as the horses went past, you got that signature flutter as mm -hmm. they right. went back beyond the distance and then came back. And I just think that that's something that is a function of contrast detect autofocus. It, it is, and I, I so wish they had the... Uh, I know some people hate the dual pixel auto, the, the CMOS the sensor focus that Canons do, but frankly, I think it's better. Uh, I've had... ADDs. I had the 7D Mark II. Um, I have the well, the 5 DSR doesn't have it, but the ones that do have it, it's pretty clean. You can walk out of a scene, come back in, and you're 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 just nailed. Not so with the GH5 or the 4, for that matter. I see some improvements in the GH5 from what the 4 was, and I was a little disappointed not to see better improvements. And and that goes back to your question about the XT2. Um, the X-T2 seems to have pretty good autofocus, uh, and it seems to track, and you have to go in and kind of finagle with it a little bit, but for the most part, it responds quickly. Now, personally, this is, is my quirk, I kind of hate the X-T2. It's sort of funny. I don't like the controls. I, you know, I'm, I grew up with those kind of controls, but I find it irritating as all else to figure out where ISO I'm on. I can't read the damn numbers because they're so small on the screen, so I need my glasses to read them, which, whereas I don't need my glasses to look at, at the general pictures. So it's like I'm stuck. Either I wear my glasses, and I'm still straining with the glasses. I think it's like four-point type. It's like, come on. Why don't you make the, the, the aperture, the, the shutter speed, and the ISO just a tad bigger like they do on Nikons and Canons? No. Hey, it's, we're just getting old. Yeah, I think that's part of it because <laughs> everybody else goes, I have no problem. I'm 63, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, my eyes are bad anyway and but it's irritating that you just a little bit bigger or at least a function i remember in the old days canon used to have what size font would you like Ooh, wasn't and they got rid of it now but man that was great i would still go large fonts for the most part because usually especially if you're outside you can't see it that well anyway so a little bit helps but uh, the xt2 i think is an incredible camera i would say it's a wonderful camera in many many ways i just personally hate it 
because I don't like the function of it. It, it feels okay in the hand, not as nice as the GH5. Nothing to me feels as good in my hands as a GH4 or a GH5. Those cameras ergonomically are just, for my, my taste, amazing. Uh, oh, just I fit. They, agree with you on the, that. Uh, on the GH5 yeah. is exceptionally comfortable in the hand. Yeah. Now, on the X-T2, you guys know I fell in love with it. And six yeah. feet from where I'm sitting, I have a 27-inch by 40-inch print of one of the uh, images that I shot hmm. in New York City behind uh, the New York Public Library. Yeah. And it, it looks medium format to me. That's the, interesting. Uh, this is with the Acros uh, or Acros yep. uh, simulation. The, the gradation is, is just medium oh, format. Oh, you know what? You're right. The, that, the X-T2, when you look at the picture quality, that APS-C sensor is almost like a full-frame sensor. I was comparing it to some of the full-frame cameras I had that were Nikons and Canons. I was going, man, this thing at 24 point something megapixels looks as good or better than some of the 24 to, to 50 megapixel Canons, or Nikons for that matter, like the Canon DA10 and the D750. Though those were really good too. It's amazing the quality of pictures it gets. I just don't like it from the control point of view. Like, where's my sh what shutter am I at? And oh, wait a minute, now I'm in a different part of shutter. Now I'm on different settings and I've totally lost myself in the middle of a shot. Rather than being able to just feel it, I can't feel it on that camera. Um, so those are just, it's, it's a quirk. You know, I do, from a camera point of view, I agree it's beautiful. And their new medium format camera for the price is pretty darn nice. It's, I think it was, it's 4,500, I think, um, or 5,000. That's not good. bad for medium format with, with accessories. It's, it's nice. I've seen some of the pictures people are taking. They're gorgeous. Um, and it's not much bigger than the X-T2, frankly, just a little bit. Yeah, that's right. I, I debate in my infinite spare time doing my mind games uh, as to the value of a medium format digital camera. Uh, the, you know, the hybrid like the GH5 or the Fuji uh, X-T2, the Sony a6300, I, I think, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the sensor in the Sony a6300 and the one in the uh, Fuji X-T2 are the same and just have different processing engines. But uh, I keep asking myself, would I spend forty five hundred dollars uh, on the uh, GFX fifty S if, if that's what it is, or nine thousand dollars for a Hasselblad X one V body? Yeah. Clearly, I'm not. I'm not the target audience. No, yeah. I wouldn't, because when you're filmmaking, you need that money for other things mm -hmm. like lights. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good point, and nobody talks about lights. Nobody talks about lighting. Uh, I know a lot of photographers who say, I don't really care what camera I have as long as my lighting's good. And there's a lot of truth in that. Well, there, there is. And uh, I've gone through a, a number of lights over the last three years. I started with an Ari SoftBank 4 kit, mm -hmm. which was the size of the trunk I used to bring up to summer camp <laughs> every year. Uh, and it had five hot lights. Yeah. The last time <laughs> I used it, I practically melted the person <laughs> that I was... Uh, <laughs> and cut over to one by LEDs uh, from no-name manufacturers, but really uh, had a wake-up call with the little aperture Amaron mm. HR672C, which was amazing. Yeah, but with that ama they said, are amazing, yeah. But with that being said, the, all of these panels uh, are very limited as far as what they can do with modifiers. So when Aperture came out with the 120 single mm -hmm. point, uh, uh, light with the Bowens mount, that was really interesting. And that's the light that I use uh, right now uh, in this conversation and that I use all the time. You now. know, that looks really good. So and and is that one that can spot. go flood or spot? Uh, it, well, it's not. Uh, you can actually attach a Fresnel to it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but what I've got is their uh, light dome, and it's a two stage uh, diffuser with silvered interior. Nice. It's three feet across. Well, you know, it's nice because I'm, I'm looking at your shot right now and, and you're perfectly lit. And yet there's that soft softness as it goes out from you to the sides, which gives it a very cinema look. Oh, yeah. I love it. It is 
It is absolutely my favorite light. The one thing that I wish I'd had during this shoot yesterday was the daylight version of it. I right. used tungsten. <coughs> and I now they have a, they have a new one that just came out that does both daylight and tungsten. That's that just came out, I think. Well, so they they have a three hundred watt uh, that's just coming out, and that's very very tasty to me. The tungsten version of this lamp is also very tasty mm -hmm. to me because, you know, when you're doing on-location interviews, you're typically going to have mixed lighting. You've got yep. daylight coming in through <laughs> the mm -hmm. window, and so we were able to navigate around that. But I don't yeah. know if you can see it from this shot. Um, yeah, you can. You see the lights right in front of me over there? Mm -hmm. Those small ones, those are the blenders, the low blenders, and they do just that. They've got, they can go from... 3,200 to, I think, I don't know if they go up to 6,000, but definitely 5,600. And nice. they're nice because you can blend anything in between. They fit almost, and they're small, no heat. Uh, they come with 20-foot power cords, so they're very nice to work with and just great lights. We've used them on location. I use them in the studio now as studio lights because they give a nice kind of light. And, um, and then I use one of them as a hair light. Now, it's kind of an expensive hair light. These are like 1500 $1, for the set of three. Especially and if you're talking about lumens per strand. Yeah. Yeah. And these aren't, well, they are bright, but they don't, they don't cover as much. In other words, when they're bright, they just burn like crazy. They burn everything out. So you kind of have a, a limited range of how far you can go before you burn up. Plus, they're close to me. They're only about f four feet away, maybe five feet on that one. So they're not too far. Uh, if I bring them up, I'll, I'll be standing like this, squinting. You can't see anything. And um, they're, they're, very, they're just strong. Uh, I've got some of the other Aperture ones that aren't the, the new one, the, the one bulb one. But they're just the typical panels, 500 LED. They're good. They're really kind of nice. And then yeah, we and have... The other, the, the, so I have this, which is my editing bay and yeah. my vlogging bay. I just turn around. Uh, but downstairs, I have a small studio with uh, room for, uh, you know, a roll of paper. Mm -hmm. And when I'm doing larger tests where I want to show two gimbals at the same time or a number of lights at the yeah. same time, <clears throat> well, for that, I'm running a pair of Aperture LS half Ws mm -hmm. into the uh, backdrop. I'm using uh, an Aperture uh, studio overhead on this side and I'm using the aperture Amaron uh, on the other side so these really work well and they do they do now you might you might get a kick out of this our green we have two green screens in this studio um, I have one at home that's similar to this but in here we had enough room to put one on that side and the other one this way and guess what we're using to light it Philips um, daylight LEDs Go to Great. Home Depot and they're about 25, 26 bucks each. 5,600 with the CRI of about 90 something. And I went, wow, <laughs> that's okay. These are just, Fantastic. it's amazing. The old days, four or five years ago, the LEDs sucked. They were all yellow, dingy, not really good. And since then, they've gotten so much better. But yeah. we just put up uh, some track lighting, put the LEDs in, and, and it's lighting the green screen pretty well. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. it's actually going right through me right now because I forgot I was wearing slight green on my shirt today, just a little bit. Oh yeah, that's right. And I didn't, you know, when I got here, my wife goes, "You know, you are partially transparent." I go, "Okay, well, no, no hiding here. We are transparent." So. The that's Invisible sort of Man. Yep, it's some funny. Hugh, just before well, before we we go, I saw you did a review on the A uh, the Sony A ninety nine. Rick and I have been quite interested in that. And no, that was the A nine. Your wasn't thoughts it? on that? A nine, right? Not the A nine, not ninety nine. A is it A nine? Both. So on uh, the on the A nine, um, mm -hmm. what I what I said was that the A nine is clearly the best hybrid that Sony has ever done. Mm -hmm. Uh, the ergonomics are improved, but the way to think about it is it's still an A7 uh, body, more or less. I mean, the difference between the A9 and the A7 uh, S2 or A7R2 is kind of the difference between the 6000 and the 6300. It's a, it's a little bit more beefed up, but it's basically, uh, you wouldn't mistake it for being anything other than, than that, that lineage. 
uh, what I found is that uh, uh, it is a great camera. The 100 to 400 is a great lens, but as in all things, the gating factor was me, uh, and it still does not defy the laws of physics, uh, and it is not perfect. So it, and I wasn't the only one who experienced this, that it could lose track. Mm. Uh, and it, again, when you're following a figure skater, so you're not doing something mm. which I consider to be silly, but you're actually in service of what you're trying to capture, moving very quickly. Well, in that case, the rolling shutter is apparent uh, and can be a bit annoying. But I, I like the addition of another knob on top. The screen, the EVF is beautiful. Uh, and it's going to make a lot of people very happy. Again, for me, though, Jeff, uh, that's not my work. Uh, I'm not a sports photographer. But I, I would say that Sony was very, very sharp in the way that they positioned this and the way that they rolled it out. I mean, basically, they went straight at the heart of where DSLRs are supposed to be strong and said, oh, decisive moment, you've been missing that ever since you used DSLRs because at the moment that it is decisive, uh, there's a blackout. So there was no blackout on the A9, but hey, there's no blackout when you're in electronic shutter mode with the GH5 or the uh, X-T2. No, it's X-T2. Really, they're really clean. You can't tell. Uh, yeah. You know, it's interesting what, what I've been reading about, actually watching blogs on the A9, A9, is that, and this is sort of a dig at Sony from what everybody was doing, they they created perfect lighting for it because when people went off, like Yuri Yuryev, he he went off and did some filming outside of the, what they specified, and he goes, I got banding all over the place. and But once the light was good, perfect perfect daylight indoors and everything else, it was it was great. It actually, shot beautifully. But I gathered it's mostly electronic shutter. What they were doing. It, it has a shutter though, right? Aside a mechanical it has shutter. A mechanical shutter. But yeah. if you want to get twenty frames per second, it's electronic. But right. here's look. I, I I know Max, and I think he's very very good. I, I think he's one of the few bloggers worth watching. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But with that being said, the the general comment that oh it was perfect lighting. On the one hand, it's a legitimate. Uh, observation but on the other hand it isn't because if you're a professional sports shooter what you think it's not lit to pieces at a stadium yeah, right <laughs> or, uh, the nba uh, or the nfl of course they're lit to the nth degree because they have to be uh, covered by television mm-hmm. broadcast cameras so it's a it's actually a non sequitur it's yep. a difference without a meaning yep it's just interesting. That's what came out afterwards, or somebody somebody came up with. There was quite a few bloggers talking about that. Of course, one thing one thing about a lot of the bloggers that I've noticed throughout the years is they love to highlight the bad of any camera, and it's like, yeah, okay, sure, no, no camera is perfect, and you really need more than one. But it is amazing how they really go after one. Like the GH5 got reamed instantly for bad focus. Yeah, you know, I agree. Sometimes, sometimes the focus isn't exactly what you want. On the other hand, 90, I'd say in things I've done, 95% has been perfect. So well, Rick, I guess what I would say is this. I, I understood before I bought the camera, and Jeff, as you continue to think about it, I understood mm. beforehand what the limitations of the auto right. were. Right. And I, I thought that they were, that the GH5 and the GH4 have significantly worse autofocus than the A6300. But oh, yeah. again, before mm-hmm. I ever had it, I said, I don't think there's any way it can be as good. Uh, but with that said, the thing that I keep in mind is the engineers at all of these companies, I think, are better at what they do than I am at what I do. And it's, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know exactly what word I want to use, but I, I can get annoyed if a camera company misleads. Uh, I think it is uh, a mistake on the part of Panasonic to bury in its manual that autofocus, they actually have a line that says autofocus will not work with 4K. I think that... Will not work with 4K? 
that's what it says. And and Max was the one who found that too. I've shot with 4K without much of an issue. Um, yeah, well, so so I have too, but they, hmm. that was in there. Yeah, just, in case, just, just in case. Just in case. Up front. Uh, yeah. And then with all of them, with all of them, the engineering is amazing. It is. The real issue is marketing. And when... Uh, and even down to Tony Northrup has done a, a number of really excellent, mm -hmm. excellent videos on ISO and equivalence, both in terms of crop factor and uh, aperture. And when uh, a camera manufacturer says, you know, I've got a 42.5mm uh, 1.2 Noctocron, well, technically it is 1.2. But no one's correcting people when they say, oh, it's like the equivalent of an 85 1.2. No, it's not. As we said earlier, it's an equivalent of an 85 2.4 from the perspective of depth of field. True. That is true. Yeah. Yeah, that's just Anyway, Jeff, back to, to you. I think that if you're shooting horses where you're not following them on a racetrack, um, mm -hmm. where you are not trying to... Uh, use a gimbal and track someone like Claudia does walking backwards with me on the high mm -hmm. line that the GH5 is, is really an exceptional camera and from where I sit truly now that I have it it confirms what, what I thought earlier when I was still thinking about it uh, confirms my assessment that uh, I would have to pay almost six thousand uh, yeah. dollars in, in other uh, camera lines to get the combination of video features that mm -hmm. I need for documentary. Yeah, it's true. So, it's uh, you know, it's funny. If, if there's only one real manufacturer who probably, well, actually two really. If you look at Nikon and Canon, especially Canon, Canon seems to compete only against itself and badly. And Nikon is out there going, "Wait, we have a new DSLR. Anybody want to look at it?" Um, and they're both sort of odd. They don't have marketing departments that make a lot of sense. You've got Sony, which everybody bashes sony I, I don't know why i actually had a sony which i didn't mind i just it was a bridge camera i liked it but it didn't fit my fit my needs at the moment i just gave it to a friend as a gift and he was happy um but sony makes some cool stuff and people forget sony makes almost every sensor in the world save for canon and probably sigma everybody else is using sony sens uh, sensors well, well, Sony has 40.2% 40, 40 last time I looked of the global sensor market. And yeah. mm -hmm. what's, what's brilliant is that they've got sensors in all different form factors, including mm -hmm. cell phones. So they're using their small uh, smartphone technology or are informed by that in their larger format cameras and mm -hmm. vice versa. So yeah. it is a compelling uh, core competency that, that no one else can match. No, uh -huh. and when everybody says, I've got a Panasonic camera, I've got this and that, yeah, but you've got a Sony sensor in it. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the brand is, they're still using Sony sensors, and it just proves that what they can do with software, all of these manufacturers may be a little bit different, but they're all somewhere in the same line. Now, the Sony sensors are really top-notch with the backlit sensors and all the stuff that they're doing. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and their full frame sensors at their sizes and the amount of picture quality they capture is pretty mind boggling. And it's, it's like you said, $4,500 camera, do you need it or not? No, I bought a $4,500 5DSR. I'm not a landscape photographer and I do some portraits, but believe me, that was a tax write off. It wasn't because I had any real purpose to it other than it looked like a fun camera, so I'll buy it. Um, that's not what I would normally buy and I wouldn't buy it again even though I liked it I almost sold it but I kept it I don't know why I kept it but I felt that I spent so much on it I didn't want to get rid of it because uh, I told you to yeah he told to me to <laughs> that's true <laughs> Jeff goes what are you crazy keep it um, and I do like it it's just that it's not something I can walk around the streets and take a lot of shots with it's not built for that um, and, and I think too many people get stuck on the specs rather than what the camera does and really what they do with it and once they figure that out, and of course, I had a healthy bout of gas, the gear acquisition syndrome. So once I got rid of that in my system, I feel a lot, lot better. I'm happy with the cameras I have. I'm going to get rid of my X-T2s only because for me, they don't work that well. Uh, they work fine. They just don't work for me, for my usage. Um, and the people in-house here don't seem to care about it too much either. So, okay, we'll stick to some of the other cameras. And, and lately, I've been thinking of getting some really high-end camcorders because ultimately we do a lot more video filming and that 
would work for us. It's it's interesting that you mentioned that, Rick, because when we were shooting yesterday, we had two locations and three different people and three different setups. Hmm. And I I turned to Claudia and said, you know, even though I've got these high speed SD cards, uh, the two thousand X Lexar cards, yeah. it was fantastic because it just rolled in the GH five from one to the next. Mm-hmm. And when the second one ran out, I hot swapped with another one. That was fantastic. But if you have a a monitor or monitor recorder, a seven inch field recorder like like I did, mm-hmm. you're bringing chargers for different kinds of batteries, right. and you're bringing different kinds of batteries. And I I turned to Claudia and I said. I actually get SSDs or QXD yep. or XQD cards now. I get the notion of a high-end dedicated camcorder. Mm-hmm. The problem is that again, that starts at three times the price of the GH5. Yeah, it does now. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather have a two-camera uh, or even three cameras set up. You know, like the you you know. Uh, um uh, Jordan and Chris from the camera store. Oh yeah, they're great. And they film almost everything they do with the what is it, the FS eight or six? I uh, forgot which one they're doing from Sony, the camcorder. And they go, hopper. they love grass it. Hopper. They just love it. They We're said for the most part it works. They don't have to worry about changing a lot of stuff out. It just all there. Uh, it's six seven grand, but you know what? It's a nice camcorder, and I've been really considering that one as one of the ones we want to get for when we do more corporate shoots the cameras are nice the dslrs but they're a little more unmanageable than a simple camcorder that's just what we've I, noticed I, yeah i love the fs5 uh, i used the fs5 at a uh, rally during the presidential mm-hmm. uh, cycle this last presidential cycle and it worked incredibly well and it's interesting because the people who have fs7s and yeah. full use fs7s they don't want to go near the FS5, but <laughs> it's a, it's actually a fantastic camera. On the other hand, uh, and, and the thing is you can use bigger batteries and you can even go right. raw if you want to. But uh, the flip side, again, is it just costs a pile It's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a lot of money. Uh, does that one have replaceable lenses? Yes, it's it interchangeable does. lenses. Yeah, interchangeable. Which, which yep. I loved because... Uh, in that particular live event, I just used the 18 to 105, and the software correction was good enough. This was always intended to be on Facebook, mm-hmm. absolutely fine. Yeah. But if it's your own gear for your personal work, mm-hmm. uh, that 18 to 105 doesn't do it for me. On the other hand, you can then use any of the E-mount lenses, and that's fantastic. So the 18 to 105, was that a Sony lens? That that's the eighteen to one hundred five PZ. It is a Sony lens. Okay. But uh, recently, Sony introduced the uh, eighteen to one ten uh, one hundred five, mm-hmm. I think, uh, which is like the little brother to the uh, twenty eight to one thirty five PZ, which is a lovely, lovely lens. Uh, but it's got a better focal range for a Super 35 or APS-C <coughs> right. so- yeah. sensor. Uh, but even so, I wish that it were 16 millimeter hmm. uh, because I like 24 millimeter at the wide end, not 28. To me, and for other people, that may seem like a silly small difference, but to me, that's a significant difference. And I just much prefer the field of view of that 24 millimeter full frame equivalent. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice field of view and and a lot of people always get mixed up when they buy panasonics or olympuses and they stop buying 24 millimeter lenses and they go it's not that wide that's because it's really 48 <laughs> yeah. you know well I, th- I, th- I think the pair of you've convinced me i've got to get the gh5 <laughs> and one of the redeeming features that i do love about it as i said i like to do a lot of video but one of the real selling points to me that a lot of people didn't cover a lot about was the fact that I can film for an hour or whatever, but it's in one file, yeah, where my FZ-1000, I can film for half an hour, but it does it in six-minute strips. Mm-hmm. And I hated that, having hundreds, whereas I've got well, one uh, file. If I want to sync sound, it's much, much easier. And that was the GH4 as well. You didn't have unlimited files. It would break them right. up. 
So, so right. So again, this this shoot that we did yesterday, I had two clips that were more than 50 minutes long, mm -hmm. Jeff. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a non-issue. Which makes it more of a camcorder as a camera, mm -hmm. which is nice. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. No, it's, it's terrific. But again, all of them are terrific in the right hands and the right true. circumstances. Mm -hmm. But I think, Jeff, I think you'll, you'll love the GH5. Because mm. as I said, I've got the FZ1000, and I love that, and it's a step up. It's got all, all the, the different things, the things that I'm lacking from the FZ1000, so I can't think, I can't see as I can go wrong with that. I agree. No, in yeah. fact, I think you'd enjoy it. It, you, it is if fun. If you do want to go long, I mean, my, my first uh, experience with this bad boy is that it works really, really well. Mm. Which one's that one? The one hundred to seven hundred. Oh, the, okay. Now that's not that expensive a lens, right? Is that like four hundred bucks? No, no, no. Uh, no. So I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking of their cheaper no, one no, to no, four hundred. No. They have, they have one that was cheap. This is their new one. Yeah, this is their new one. Okay, and what's that one going 18, for? Eighteen hundred. Eighteen hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They have like a four hundred dollar version of that. It's nowhere near as good. The glass, I think that's so so glass from what I heard, but. Yeah, this is their new one, which is just getting very good reviews from people. And it's so small. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Now, with that being said, 2.8 is a big difference when you're shooting. Oh, yeah. 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 By the way, when I, when I broke my uh, 12 to 60 millimeter uh, lens, that the repair cost me 409 bucks with shipping and tax included and that was i didn't think it was too bad it was i, I paid 950 for the lens and um they basically charged it they said it needed a full lens kit that means the whole inside got replaced uh but i have a feeling they're probably sending me a brand new lens and just they fix the other one later because in essence all of the inside got replaced and because <laughs> uh, that's about what the parts would cost at what they would sell it as as probably retail because retail you figure the the, the resellers are probably getting it for four fifty five hundred and then they sell it for <laughs> nine fifty so the three seventy of parts was probably to them one hundred and sixty seventy and that 's how they make their money so it 's basically buying the lens wholesale from them again and, and rick let 's let 's face it you didn 't actually drop your camera you actually threw it I threw it <laughs> I threw it with a vengeance with a bag it actually threw it so it wasn 't just a drop it was sort of <laughs> really oh flew. my gosh! <laughs> yeah, I mean, it literally flew about five feet in the air as I'm watching it, going, "Huh," <laughs> and, and just couldn't get it in time. You must have had your heart in your throat. Oh, I tell you, for that <laughs> moment, I went. <gasps> my eyes opened. I have never in my life dropped a camera or a lens. I mean, I've lived a pretty long life. I've had cameras for a long time, and I went, "I can't believe." Now, I didn't directly drop it. My bag dropped it, <laughs> but still, uh, it was frustrating. It's like I can't believe that just happened. Um, it's one of those things and of course I'm at home like the next day holding a lens I almost dropped it but it went into the other hand I go no no I'm not touching anything for a week just stay away <laughs> from all lenses um, no that really discombobulated me I go I can't believe I just went had a flying disaster uh, and we've done a lot of video and photo shooting and never had any breaks we had a Manfrotto tripod break once but it was really a piece of junk Manfrotto and we went back to the retailer and, and they, they swapped it on us. They go, sorry, you got a bad one. Um, and other than that, no, we've been, we treat our stuff like silk. As we, we're very gentle with our gear. And I know Jeff's the same way on his stuff. It's, it's professional gear. You don't treat it like a bee. Some people are really rough on their stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't get it. You spend that much money and you just treat it badly. It makes no sense. No, it doesn't. And the fact is, the 12 to 60 is actually a lovely. It is. Lovely I like it. That's why I had it fixed. I, at first, my wife goes, Do you really need to get it fixed? Oh, yeah. I mean, I do. <laughs> and she's going, Didn't you just spend a thousand? Uh huh. Um, it's a great focal range. It, it, you know what? And it's, it's a. Cl I thought it was clean lens for video. It was so quiet. Oh, yeah. It, it is, and it's, and it's OIS as well. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, I'll tell you, we were talking about the X-T2. One thing I did really enjoy about the X-T2 are the lenses. They're not, not all of them from what I've heard, but the ones I had were really quiet, and they all filmed very, very well. So from well, that point so, of view, nice. So, so I've now experienced uh, four Fujinon lenses. Uh, the 16 millimeter 1.4 by far. Hmm. 
my my favorite lens. Yeah. yeah. But the uh, fifty six millimeter one point two. Yeah, I have that one. Gorgeous. It's the nice. Fifty six one point two, and we've talked about this before. That one is noisy. Uh, but the 16 1.4 is silent. And the other thing that's great about the 16 1.4 is you pull the focusing collar mm -hmm. down. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. you do not only manual focus, but it has hard stops I know. at both ends. Yeah, that's nice. Not fly-by-wire. Exactly. Well, you know, Jeff, maybe uh, maybe Rick will give you a good deal on the X-T2 and, and that'll get you off a of GH5. No, I don't think so. I'll, I'll, you know, I, I buy my cameras. I just let Rick have them for a month, and he, <laughs> if, he, if he still likes it after a month, it's a consideration. If yeah. he still likes it after three months, I'm going to buy it because I'm waiting a couple a month more until the GH5 to see well, whether he Jeff, hates I did that. Or have not, my but XT, he still XT, loves that. So I'm, Jeff, I'm, I'm, I, I'm I did good. have my XT2s now almost six months, seven months. You didn't get those, but you knew I didn't like it that much. So, um, <laughs> but you know, I'll tell you one thing about the XT2 that I thought was the best of all. The color is the only mm. camera I've seen as good or better than Canon. Period. The Canon, the colors are just Sony colors are too bluish. They're just not as clean usually. Uh, Panasonic isn't all that clean. They're not as the skin tones aren't as good. But Canon and even Nikon's not as good as Canon on color. Uh, but the Fuji X-T2, and, and actually I heard all Fujis are like that, the colors are amazing on them. Uh, and I guess that's their history with film, making just incredible film. And wow, there's stuff. When I started taking pictures of people and some videos, I was looking at it going, wow, did I just take that with a Canon? Or, hmm, it really looked that good. It, that's, Jeff, are you taking bets on whether or not Rick really sells them? Well, I haven't sold them yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but I probably will. I did find the boxes the other day. I have everything ready to go, but I haven't sold them and I haven't packed them yet. But we'll see. Um, I may sell them just to get more gear. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't have enough gear. Anyway, well, hey Hugh, it's been a pleasure again having you on. We look forward to having you join us again. Good discussion. Well, thanks, guys. It is a pleasure for me Thank too. You. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, we're all lonely. I think we're all lonely. We always play with our gear so much, and when we get to play with other people who play with gear, it's fun. So, it's a good time. Looking forward to one of these days we can meet in person. That would be real fun. That would be. So, what do you think? Photo Kina 2018? That's the one in Europe, right? Yes. Probably. Oh, 2018? Maybe. Maybe. Mm. That might be interesting. Um, yes, we should, should make a point of doing something like that. That would be great. That would be fun. I miss NAB. Did you go to NAB? Yes, he did. I, oh, you did. I, you I you did. were out there. Yeah, I wanted to, and this year we didn't. And uh, I've never been to NAB. I've sent people there, but I've never gone myself. And I don't like the huge shows. I tend to just feel like uh, too crowded. Too. I used to go to. I'll give you some history. I used to go to Comdex all the time, and that was on two hundred thousand people, and you couldn't get a bus. You couldn't get a cab. It was just a line after line. After, I hated it. And so that kind of got me off of big shows if I can avoid them. But NAB looks fun. It just really does look fun. Well, so. and what's interesting is you bump into all kinds of people. Mm, yeah, that's true. A pile of bloggers that I know. Uh, I actually had meals with, with several people I know. And it was really nice. This is the uh, second time now that people have walked up and said, Hey, Hugh, and I, I swear I'm going senile because I'm going... <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it's just people who, who watch the channel. Yeah, and they're really nice and knowledgeable, and it's just lovely. It's, uh, it's and, fun. And proves it's to fun. me anyway, once again, that in the end, it is all about the people. Yeah, so, and one thing we love about your channel and and the work you do is you have little twists to what you do, and I love the way you weave your stories yes. because you're <laughs> always weaving the story into the. I, I don't know. I just really enjoy it. Have a lot of fun with what you do and the way you do it. And uh, it's different. And that's what makes that's, it more fun. That's, mm -hmm. I think that you're one of the few guys I can watch who's got a close-up on himself for five minutes and I'm still watching. So, that's, you know, <laughs> hey, that's skill. That is skill. So, I, so back to the Sony A9, I, I did this uh, losing sleep over the A9 or whatever. And it really, I had a rough night. I had insomnia. I was up in New York at the Sony shooting event. Yeah. 
So I did that little homage to uh, Michael Mann and Miami mm -hmm. Vice and yep. Lost in Translation and her. And then I got up to do the A roll and I used a 15 millimeter. And I can't tell you how many people are commenting, dude, step back. <laughs> you're just too close. And all I could do is write back, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, Hugh, well, you have a great one. Have a good Memorial Day weekend. It's a long one for us, so yeah, uh, you too, guys. that's always good. And uh, Jeff, we'll see you next week. And next week, we've mm -hmm. got another one of our joint friends. We've got Curtis Judd back on. Um, oh, Curtis is a I love Curtis. Guy. He's a and he's I, just he's a wonderful guy. He lives out. In, we should all meet him in Park City. That's a gorgeous place to go. Yeah, and I, I actually said to Curtis, I had just seen uh, some review that he had done, and all I remembered is that the audio was. Outstanding. Oh, he's always got good audio. He yeah. he he's like us. He loves audio gear. We've got all the compressors, limiters, gates, and you know we've got just here. I've got a lot of gear, and he's the same way. He's got all the good gear, and uh, even when he does video recordings, he's got some nice stuff. And it, it's fun because not a lot of the video guys like audio that much. And audio is fun. Without the audio, the video is only half good. So. Yeah, I, I agree. And and he's just a really, really nice guy. Yeah, have you mm -hmm. met him in person? I have not yet met him in oh, person. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we know each other. Okay. Uh, I, I hold him in very high regard. Um, we bumped into each other uh, on the show floor, actually. Oh, how funny. And he's a tall guy. He's like 6'7", I think. So. He's, he's very tall. My son-in-law is 6'5", and awesome. I'm looking up at him, and I'm 6'2", and feeling short with all these guys going, wow. You know, what happened? Where did the forest come from? Uh, yeah. But they're, they're just good guys. Curtis and is she, just, uh, and his brother, his brother films too. Really good folks. Yeah. Anyway, so we will see you next time. And for all you guys watching the show, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, give us comments, feedback, anything you want to hear, let us know. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good Memorial Day weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks to you.